Won't you sing me a song? Singing now that I am with you For I won't be with you long a good Tuesday morning to you. It is January 11th, 2022. Thanks for making Real Talk part of your day. This episode is presented by our good friends at Bitcoin Well. Uh, if you're got, I mean, you're, you're, you're along the spectrum of crypto questions. Uh, maybe you're well along the way. You're going, I've been paying attention to this stuff for eight, nine years now. Or maybe you have no idea, not a hot clue what anybody's talking about when it comes to Bitcoin. Either way, if you've got questions, they've got the answers. You can find them under the Sponsors tab on our website, ryanjesperson.com. Real Talk starts right now. Here's Ryan Jesperson. Coming up in about 10 minutes time, we're going to check in with, uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to this conversation, a journalist, an ER doctor, a panel that uh, Sarah Hoyles has put together. If you're like me, there's a whole bunch of people in your life right now that are that are talking about, well, when it comes to COVID-19 and when it comes to the Omicron variant in particular, we might as well just go get it. Uh, what do you want to just go get it so we can we can we can finally be relieved. We can take it off our shoulders, the pressure, the stress. We want to just go get sick. Everybody's going to get sick anyway. Right. Well, I might not blame you for feeling that way, quite frankly. Uh, it, it would appear as though every single person is going to get sick at one point. So you might as well just get sick so we can get it over with and we can start going on our vacations and we can start hanging out again, except for healthcare professionals. And others are keeping an eye on this going, no, this is this is not the attitude we want to have. This is not a, a healthy trend. This is not the perspective we want to adopt. Please do not just go get Omicron. That a piece in Vice News uh, by Anya Zoledja. She's going to join me along with Dr. Eddie Lang, an ER doctor. And we're going to get into what perhaps the most informed perspective needs to be right now, acknowledging at the same time that we still don't know everything. We don't have the long-term perspective here. When I use that word long in the context of COVID, it reminds me that we don't even really have a fulsome understanding of what long COVID is going to look like and what many of the people that have, have yeah, survived COVID-19, that have been over COVID-19 for a while, what some of their health challenges might look like in the years to come. So that's what we're going to get into today a little bit later on in this show. Coming up in about half an hour, 40 minutes from now, we're also going to check in with Dr. Paulette Steves. Uh, Dr. Steve's a Canada research chair who's been working on a, a project, a very meaningful one, an important one, documenting uh, Canada's history of uh, residential schools. We're going to find out exactly what prompted this specific project and what the implications are. We wanted to update you on that. This is an ongoing conversation we know that Canadians are having and an ongoing commitment that this show will have uh, as we continue to understand what meaningful reconciliation looks like in Canada. So those are two of our focuses this morning. Of course, there's much other. Uh, I mean, there are many other headlines that are that are making news around us, so to speak. And Sarah Hoyles, the editorial producer of this show, keeping an eye on those, including in my mind, Hoyles, a pretty cool if we can call this a lead off story for this this buzz segment of ours. We, we focus on what's making news. A man in the United States right now in recovery after receiving a heart transplant, a pig heart. The first time that American surgeons have attempted this. What's, what's the deal? What's the background here? The first time anyone has attempted this, really. It's uh, he has heart failure, fatal heart failure. The gentleman does not the potentially. Pig. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, definitely fatal for the pig. Yeah, yeah the pig. Uh. <laughs> and so, yeah, it's been three days since the surgery. The patient seems to be doing well. But the doctors have said, hey, 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 it's still like this is long game. So we're going to wait and see how this, you know, if there's if the body rejects it, uh, how the patient's health yeah, does. It was fascinating. I was uh, keeping an eye on some of the stories out of the U.S. Uh, just covering this. And and again, the, the, the guy finds himself in a dire circumstance, right, where he says, we, we, you know, I, I mean, it's not looking good for me uh, as is and the possibility of a of an appropriate human heart, the availability of a human heart just isn't there. So we're going to try this out. He says, obviously, he wants to survive. This is a young guy. He's not even 60 yet, right? He says, I don't want to die. I want to be around for my family. But if I don't survive this, 
uh, potentially surgeons, researchers will be able to learn something about what the future of, of organ transplants or organ availability could look like. It's, it's a fascinating bigger picture story too, not just about this guy. Absolutely. I mean, you referenced the show The Nick before um, and how they basically showed how like how discoveries in medicine were made and it, it has to be trial and error. I mean, educated guesses, but nonetheless, we got to give it a go. And this guy was game for it. Yeah. So they've been they've been keeping an eye on. Uh, I was I did a bit of a you know, I got into like a rabbit hole yesterday and started um, learning a little bit more about like why pigs for example, and what could the implications be? What other organs might be available? People talk about like livers and kidneys. And when it's bad news for the pigs, for starters, uh, what's also fascinating is that the uh, the researchers have, these are like genetically modified pigs. And this is one of the things that really caught my eye. This is, you know, sometimes you feel like you go, I'm doing all right in life. Like I, I think my parents are probably, you know, I, I hope I make my parents proud. I'm accomplishing all these things. And then you see what other people are doing for a living, like these researchers, and you feel completely inadequate. But they've recognized which, would you say chromosomes or at least which element of the pig's genetics uh, prove to be problematic you know, when it comes to organs uh, translating into, you know, human applications. And they've been able to like mute or quell or halt, block those genetic influences. And so these organs are wow. more appropriate for human transplant. It's fascinating. You did take a deep dive. Stuff. Oh man. Well, I was just, because I knew that you and I were going to talk about this today. And of course the story is fresh. So you can find coverage of it all over the place. Mm. And uh, I mean, talking to this guy's cardiologist, uh, the guy himself hasn't done a lot of interviews ahead of time, I would imagine, because this would be a heavy thing, right? I don't yeah. know how you like I even I even try to think I I, I I try not to get sort of two out there on this. But I would imagine <laughs> if you're this guy and you wake up this morning and you've probably got, a, you know, you've got a, a, a big bunch of staples in your chest. Right. You've got this and and, and you're cognizant and you're aware and you're greeting your you know your the nurses coming in and the doctors are checking up on you and maybe you have you can facetime or maybe you can see your family in person i suspect that he's probably not seeing many visitors right now but but beating in your chest is the heart of a pig i mean it's just it's it's a little bit mind-blowing and I'm i you'd be obviously very grateful for it but at the same time it would probably throw you for a bit of a loop absolutely but i mean you look at the physiology between pigs and humans and they're really really close yeah. Um, like how the system works. So yeah, it's wild. Uh, maybe at some point they'll be able to, you know, grow organs just in test tubes. And so they won't have to actually harvest it from a pig, but that's my bleeding heart. So no you know, and, 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 and yeah, I, I was even, I was watching this too. And I'm going, this is absolutely amazing that, that we can, we can do this and, and science, to, you know, in some circumstances seems to have no bounds. And this is really amazing for us. And then part of me, I'll be honest, just here's the real talk. Part of me was the same thing. I was like, are there like moral, you know, if this like if this was a Disney movie, um, all of the pigs would be talking to each other coming again. The humans would be the evil ones and all the pigs would be having meetings being like they're starting to like harvest our organs. You guys, this is no, this is not good. There's no bueno. And the pigs would be having big meetings. Um, I will say when, when it comes to the harsh realities of the laws of nature, um, typically humans are, you know, right up near the top of the list. And maybe this is just part of the reality. I would love to know how people are wrapping their minds around this. Real talkers. What an amazing story, a marvel of technology. Uh, Sarah Hoyle's keeping an eye on other stories that are making news today as well. And perhaps we'll check in. As I know a lot of people, a lot of tennis fans are talking about Djokovic right now, the Australian Open and the implications of, 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 of his circumstance around Australian immigration related to the fact that he's not vaccinated and the court challenge and Really interesting to see Australia relatively unapologetic on this. And uh, listen, we've Australia's prime minister, we've had the toughest or among the toughest lockdown measures on planet Earth. And that means that uh, if you want to come to Australia, you're welcome to come as long as you're vaccinated, as long as you adhere to the, the rules. And uh, that, you know, applies whether or not you're the world's number one ranked tennis player. And so implications for the Australian Open there. And, uh, you know, the court challenges are underway. And what's really fascinating here, I think, is what the other athletes are saying. Rafael Nadal saying, uh, listen, you know, the, the all planet Earth has basically come to a halt. Everybody's done everything that they can 
when it comes to COVID-19 and, and that includes athletes and, and sort of implying it's kind of disheartening to see this. So that's a story we're keeping an eye on as well. You can send us your thoughts anytime. We're always keeping an eye on the hashtag real talk RJ that hashtag as you know, is powered by the team at Park Power, uh, providing internet, electricity, and natural gas utilities. If you're living in the province of Alberta, like we are, you have a choice of where you get your utilities, where you get your internet, electricity, natural gas. Why not take your business to the company that does business with us and that plugs 10% of its electricity profits back into nonprofits in the community. It's why we're proud to do business with Park Power. You can take your business over there, compare rates if you like today at parkpower.ca. Also, a big shout out to our friends at Kubi Energy. You know, if you're going solar, if you have sustainable energy goals, whether it's your home, your farm, maybe it's your commercial property, they've actually got a deal, Kubi does, with Park Power, where you can set up a structure that will allow you to sell your surplus power back. It's a great benefit for customers of Kubi Energy who are providing solar energy solutions to power your life. A full service contractor for solar power systems in Western Canada based out of Edmonton and Kamloops, British Columbia. You can find them online at kubienergy.ca. And we also wanted to give a big shout out to our friends at Jet Set Parking. Now, I know that not everybody's traveling these days, but for those of you that are taking a moment to just get away you know, there's a lot of opportunity right now to leave money in your jeans. If you book ahead of time at jetsetparking.com using the promo code REALTALK, you're going to be able to park at a discounted rate for travel all the way up to the end of 2022. That's right. For the next 12 months, you can advance book your travel right now at jetsetparking.com using the promo code Real talk. You're going to be able to park for $8 a day right now. That's where the special promo code pricing is at. That's, of course, far less than what you would pay anywhere else parking anywhere near Edmonton's International Airport. You'll find them online again at jetsetparking.com. So where are you at with COVID? I mean, it's a question that people are asking friends and loved ones across the country and quite frankly, around the world. It's the Omicron variant that's changing everything for folks, whether your reality right now is wondering whether or not you should be sending kids back to school, whether or not you should be heading back to work, whatever the case is, the chances are you are starting to wrestle with some of the questions that come with emerging from a pandemic. But here's the thing. The numbers of hospitalizations are higher than they've been in Canada over the last two years. And medical professionals continue to warn against the strains on the healthcare system. So what's the right move? Our next two guests are right in the thick of this and, and come at this from two different perspectives, which I'm really grateful for. Anya Zolegeshi is a journalist for Vice News, and we featured, we showed you Anya's piece in Vice just a couple of minutes ago. It speaks to the straight talk, which is what really caught our eye about it. No, you don't want to just go out and get COVID. Please do not just go get Omicron. That is what Anya is, is begging you to consider. And of course, we wanted to get a, a medical take on this as well, a medical perspective. And we're grateful to have ER Dr. Eddie Lang uh, making time for us this morning. I want to say a warm welcome to the both of you. And thanks for making time for us. Uh, Anya, why don't, why don't we start with you? I, I think the question may have an obvious answer, but what was it that prompted your piece and vice? Are, are you seeing everything uh, around you the same as I've characterized it, even close personal friends of yours, maybe saying, maybe we should just go get sick. Yeah, totally. First of all, do you hear me okay? We can hear you perfectly. Amazing. Yeah, so actually I want to shout out my editor because the idea for the piece was hers. Um, but it, it comes from, I think, all of the conversations we're all having about this. You know, I have my own friend group where some people are being more careful than others. And it's all coming from a good place. Like these are people who are vaccinated, who are have have been isolating physical like social distancing the whole time, but um, I think the personal risk there's the impression that it is lower, so the gray area is a lot higher. And so I know that you know we were talking about that informally, my editor and I, my editor and her colleagues, etc. And so that kind of led to the birth of the piece that I think resonated with a lot of people, maybe frustrated a few others. 
Well, and uh, listen, I, you know, I think that this conversation is, is going to frustrate people regardless. Um, uh, Dr. Lang, maybe, maybe, maybe you might agree or, or maybe you might disagree, but, but I know that people that are wanting to have earnest conversations about COVID-19 are running into roadblocks because I, I mean, so many people have such strong feelings, whether it's the kids need to be back in school or the kids should not be back in school, or we must wear masks or it's time to stop wearing masks. I mean, the lines are starting to get drawn and the conversations in my mind appear to be getting more and more polarizing. Are you seeing the same thing? Yeah, no question. Uh, we are always, we are really in a period of uncertainty. Uh, we don't know definitively what the effect of Omicron will be, but uh, what on some of the things that are clear is that this wave is very different than uh, the, the Delta wave. Uh, we are seeing a much milder disease, uh, relatively far fewer hospitalizations for the number of cases that we know are out there. And when people do come into the hospital, they're about as likely to be coming in with an incidental case of COVID. In other words, they're, they're coming into the hospital with good old appendicitis, but because they had a scratchy throat, someone chose to do a swab on them, and sure enough, they are positive. That's just reflecting how incredibly rampant the infection is. But I do agree with Anya that we just don't have clear science to say that a uh, going to an Omicron party is a good thing. That would be premature. There's a number of good reasons not to do that. Uh, we know that this can make kids really sick. We know that uh, even though it's really rare, the unvaccinated, the elderly, those with multiple medical conditions can get into trouble. So um, I would also not advise on intentionally trying to get Omicron at this point. Yeah. And yeah, it was interesting. You cited, uh, you know, comments from the, the director general of the World Health Organization, who is saying and yesterday I, I, I found myself on the show. I used the word mild. Uh, just like Dr. Lang just did. And I'll get both of you to comment on this, but Anya, you first. People are saying, hey, please, please don't use the word mild. It's sending the wrong message to people. It's sending the wrong message to folks. Now, whether or not it's accurate, the, the symptoms uh, you know, indicating that perhaps most people's experience might be a little bit more mild, it's coming across right now as a bit of a loaded word. Yeah, you know, and I think firstly, and Dr. Lang can obviously correct me too, but for the most part, when we talk about severity, we're talking about hospitalizations, but there is everything before that. And so that can be like, my own father got COVID, got Omicron, and he was totally knocked out. And so I'm thinking about, you know, people who might be more precariously employed, who don't have paid sick, sick leave, who like six days of, you know, recovery and not being able to work, that's that's like a matter of whether you can pay rent or not. And so we have to think about not just whether you end up in the ICU or in the hospital where we already see hospitals are strained and healthcare workers are burnt out and short staffed because they themselves are getting sick. We're also seeing, you know, so much illness that can disrupt so much life and so many daily things that we need to get done. And it is an equity issue. I think when we talk about personal risk, you know, if you're like a middle or middle upper class or upper, upper class person with rights and, you know, afforded paid sick leave, maybe the personal risk is low if you're fully vaccinated. But who are you passing it to? And can that person like afford to take those days off the way you could? And is missing six days of pay really mild? I don't mm. I don't think so. Yeah, we got an interesting email. I'll, I'll read it after we talk to the two of you. I know we have you for limited time, but from somebody yesterday that was referencing our conversation about students in BC and Alberta going back to school. And they were saying, we heard a lot of the comments from your audience members yesterday, and there was a lot of privilege in those comments. And and, and I'm not sure that everybody really considers that. that. Maybe that's the thing about privilege is that when it's yours, it's not always on your radar. And, and it is a good point. I, I mean, people are going to talk about this great Barrington declaration that was that came out about a year ago. And, and I know that a lot of experts have said, listen, this thing was debunked. This thing was debunked right from the outset. But one of its assertions was that we should essentially sequester the most vulnerable and then let the rest of society just function per usual and try to pursue this so-called herd immunity while protecting people that are the most vulnerable. And I sense that these days there's a bit of a swell of that kind of a sense surfacing again. And doctor, I wonder if it's maybe just because quite frankly, people that wouldn't have considered it before are now just exhausted. They're done. 
It's been two years and they're starting to wonder what more can we do? Oh, there's no question. My colleagues uh, and healthcare providers are certainly at the end of their rope. No one would ever have imagined that we'd be in a fifth wave and we're almost two years in. So folks are certainly fed up, but um, I think there are some really promising signals. Uh, hospitalization rates are definitely curbing downwards in a number of U.S. states and in some European jurisdictions. And let's just remember here that you know, in the first wave, we had people coming into our emergency department three, four, five a day, incredibly hungry for air, unable to breathe with oxygen levels that were incompatible with life. Morgues were being set up in trucks outside of uh, New York City emergency departments. This is just not the case now. So this is a completely different animal um, virus, uh, even though um, it's and it's clearly causing many, many, many more cases than we saw with with Alpha and Delta, and yet we're just not seeing the same severity. So hopefully um, the mass amount of infection that's going around is, without trying to accelerate it, is going to give us some benefit, and we'll be out of this in a couple of weeks. And, you know, what do you see? I mean, as a journalist, obviously, it's, you, you, you kind of, you know, you have your finger on your pulse, you have your ear to the ground. How would you characterize the change or the evolution of public opinion uh, in the context of, of COVID measures? Um, one of the things that maybe surprised me a little bit yesterday, we, we ran a poll, an unofficial Twitter poll, uh, but we asked parents in Alberta whether or not they'd be sending their kids back to school. Had about 5,500 people respond to the poll. 56%, a majority of them said, yeah, we're sending our kids. Now, there's some nuance and there are some things to be considered and everybody's situation is different. But, but I think that number's higher than it would have been in previous waves. What are you noticing? You know, I'm not a sociologist, so I want to be careful about... Um you know, how much conviction I use with what I, how I answer your question. I think, you know, with the, with the school situation, obviously you also have parents who are at the end of their rope and who are probably also deciding like, I need to be effective at work and I need, you know, my kids to go to school. So there, like you said, there's nuance, but, but in terms of like adherence to public health measures and willingness to, you know, stay home, isolate as much as possible, I do think that there is definitely more of a split, especially in that majority that's been following the rules all the way through. And I don't think that's just because people are done. I think it's because every government in Canada has a different approach to how to handle it. And it's really confusing. So at the end of the day, if you're kind of left to your own devices and, you know, in Quebec, there are curfews in Alberta, you can still go out to a restaurant you all of a sudden end up having this really confusing situation and it's two years in and you're tired of it and you did everything right. So I can kind of understand why there is this split that maybe, you know, people who are in more constant contact with their grandparents might be less risk or might be more risk averse than someone who's, you know, in their 20s, not interacting with a lot of vulnerable people and is willing to take on on that risk. I think Definitely, there is more of a split between the people who have been doing it right all the way through and like aren't anti-vax and don't have fringe ideologies. But I, I think, think it does all come from a really fair place, even if it can each side frustrates the other. You've you and you've touched on such a great point. And, and Dr. Lang, I'd love for you to pick it up. And that's how how the politics of a pandemic and policies. Um, from province to province, let alone from from nation to nation, can differ so greatly that people, you can't blame them for wondering whether or not the policy that they're living under is the right one. I, I mean, I, I just in the world of sport alone, I look at, you know, the, the national championship college football game played yesterday, or I look at National Hockey League games or NBA games that are being played in some American cities, and there's 15,000 people in there, 18,000, 35,000, 50,000 people, depending on the event. And then you look at a, a Toronto Maple Leafs or a Toronto Raptors game right now, there's not a single person in the stands. And, and, and Dr. Lang, I, for a lot of people, if you're a reasonable, common sense type person, you would be able to assert that obviously there's not a definitive right or wrong or black or white here. Policy, politics, plays into it. Does it do a disservice on the science side? No, not at all. And I think we have to remember that there's an important policy decision made yesterday that's really going to change the way people perceive Omicron 
and perhaps normalizing it going forward because now the people eligible for PCR testing has been drastically reduced. You can only get a PCR test if you have a comorbid condition or you work in a nursing home or a healthcare provider. The vast majority of people have been going to the assessment centers to confirm or rule out PCR, uh, their, their status with a PCR test are now no longer eligible. So I think that's a step towards normalization. I have to remember as well that the strains on the healthcare system right now are multifold. Uh, right now, our biggest issue is not people coming to the emergency department with COVID, although we are seeing an uptick in people who are coming with very mild symptoms who just want to get tested. But half of the patients that we're holding in the emergency department who we can't get upstairs are actually mental health patients. And that's true on the pediatric side as well. So we do have to recall that there are multiple harms coming from these public health measures and the critical challenge is to find that sweet spot where we can contain Omicron reasonably without harming the society in other ways. Can we can we talk a bit more about those mental? I think that I don't know about you, Anya. That's uh, I'm not surprised. It's not news to me to hear that there have been mental health impacts from the pandemic. Uh, that is quite clear. Um, but I'm, I'm a little surprised to hear about the hospital admissions and the numbers and the ratios there, doctor. I think most people probably would be. Yeah, I'm, I don't think many people are aware of it. What people should be aware of is that opioid use is often the thermometer that speaks to the despair in the society. And you just need to follow the headlines to know that the opioid crisis has been fueled by the lockdown and that the number of patients who, a number of people who we've lost to overdoses has increased significantly over the last two years, arguably an indirect effect of the lockdown, the social isolation, and the economic impacts as well. Fascinating stuff. Um, that's Dr. Eddie Lang that you've been listening to. Doctor, I know that you have a hard out here um, at nine o'clock Mountain Time. Uh, Dr. Lang in the academic department had a professor in the Department of Emergency Medicine at the Cummings School of Medicine at the University of Calgary, also a senior health researcher at Alberta Health Services. Um, and yeah, I'm hoping I can keep you here for a quick second. I want to ask you about something else. But uh, Dr. Lang, thanks so much for giving us a, a moment here or two through your morning. We appreciate it. Anytime. My pleasure, Ryan. You got nice it. That's you, ER, uh, yeah, ER oh, physician. Nice meeting you. Uh, that's Dr. Eddie Lang. Um, I want to keep Anya around based on um, some of the work that she's done uh, along completely different lines. And so, um, Anya, I hope you don't mind me, me keeping you here for a second. In in just a few moments, I'm going to be checking in uh, with Canada Research Chair, Dr. Paulette Steves. And we're going to be talking about some work that Dr. Steves has been doing, uh, documenting the existence and the history around Canada's Indian residential schools. And and uh, in introducing you, I neglected to point out out of the gates that you won uh, the, the CAJ, the Canadian Association of Journalists Award, the Reconciliation Award in 2021 for your Indigenous Affairs reporting. Um, you've also done a ton of work uh, reporting across the country prior to your work at Vice with the CBC and other outlets. And I just wanted to I hope you don't mind, but I mean, you you have been uh, really doing remarkable work on this front. And, and I wanted to ask you um, with regards to what 2022 looks like, 2021 was a year of many difficult conversations in Canada, uh, a year of, in some circumstances, reminders of the history of residential schools. And, and, and I think uh, for many people, uh, a stark realization for many people, it just hadn't been on the radar for many different reasons. What does reconciliation look like to you in the year to come? What does that conversation look like in Canada? Where does it go? Oh man, I don't think, cause I'm not indigenous. I don't think I can answer that question in like a satisfying way for you. I think that that's definitely a question we should be asking um, indigenous folks, indigenous leaders. Um, but when it comes to the work and, and not just leaders, like, I mean, um, my step grandma's indigenous. I talk to her a lot. Like it's really, I can't have the answer to that, you know? And I think a lot of people need to recognize that, that they actually can't have the answer. That answer lies in the people who've been harmed by a century's worth of, you know, genocidal policies here in Canada and in the U S uh, but I think, you know, something that we can all be doing is we can be, you know, as opposed, I really dislike the, um, you know, adage of like voice for the voiceless as a journalist. I think that's really patronizing. And I think everyone has a voice. It's just some of us have more access to a platform. So if we can, as journalists, be like a platform or a conduit for those folks who deserve to be centered 
that's the work we can be doing. And then over time, you know, something that has come up from survivors that I've spoken to and interviewed is we're not totally at the reconciliation part. Like we're still at the truth part. Yeah. And so that's just been something that's come up in several interviews with survivors. And so I think listening, educating ourselves, you know, turning to the TRC reports, um, you know, really, I mean, the U of A free course that can get you a good intro into all of this. These are all things we can be doing so that we really own our history here in Canada and, you know, really push and hold our officials accountable to make sure that things like that don't happen again. And the ongoing inequities that stem as a direct result of the Indian Act and of residential schools and of the 60s scoop and the list goes on, those need to be addressed too. So, I mean, there's a lot of work to be done and we all have a role. So that's not to take a win. I say, I can't give you a satisfying answer. That's not to say that we don't have so much work. That's just to say, we need to listen and then also be really good allies and put a lot of pressure on officials, on anyone causing harm, and then also use our journalism to really highlight the power that communities have always had. And, you know, many officials have tried to suppress for a really long time. Mm. So many great and thoughtful points there. I, uh, I certain, and I think it's, uh, I mean, everything you've said is important, but, but how important to recognize number one, we're not done with the truth. Um, you, you don't just get to move to reconciliation. I think that there's still a lot of hard truth uh, to be heard and to be wrestled with. Um, and also ongoing inequities. Boy, have you ever hit the nail on the head there? Was there, uh, this is almost an impossibly difficult and unfair question to ask you, but through the course of your reporting, I mean, it's, it's, it's award-winning reporting uh, from the Canadian Association of Journalists. This is a meaningful professional recognition for you to be sure. Uh, was there an element of your discovery over the past year or so, uh, was there a moment that you had? Was there an epiphany of sorts? Uh, was there something that really resonated with you based on your reporting over the past year, year and a half? Yeah, I think, you know, I'm I'm really lucky because, you know, my step grandma, my Kokum, she's a Cree from Saddle Lake Cree Nation. And so I've grown up with a lot of these truths just because of who my grandmother is. Um, and, and so that was something that I think, you know, probably this year I was just, I really came to appreciate how much information I probably had that I took for granted, but in terms of journalism, you know, really realizing like we strive to do at least my team at Vice, we're striving to do trauma informed reporting, but that, that can be really difficult. And I think learning how to do trauma informed reporting and the, the costs associated with getting it wrong is something that I've had to think about a lot and and learn a lot from because we can cause a lot of harm as journalists. And I don't think we always recognize just how harmful it can be to ask someone to like share their deepest traumas. Like that can be very triggering. So even asking at the onset, you know, how are you doing? Are you comfortable with this interview today? You know, going back after a hard interview and saying, are you still comfortable with me, including the story? Because I think, too, we get stranger bias where people are willing to tell us so much because they don't know us so well. And then there's a bit of whiplash, like, oh, did I actually want to tell this journalist this story? So going back to the jur- or to the source and being like, did you actually want to tell me that story? Because I don't have to include it was something that I've really fine tuned over the last year. And that's been a really um, humbling and important, you know, I would say, set of lessons that I've had. It's impressive to say the least, uh, my friend, how you approach your craft. And Thank I appreciate you. you taking those questions. I know I know you care about the file. Um, and I knew you wouldn't mind. So we, we, we brought you here to talk about your your work covering the pandemic, but uh, as if I was going to ignore the other stuff as well. It's uh, you've, you've really been doing amazing stuff over at Vice, Anya. And we're grateful that you, you gave us a, a portion of your morning today. That's Anya Zolajowski, uh, an award-winning staff reporter at Vice World News. Thanks for this. Thanks so much. Take care and enjoy the nice weather while we have it in Edmonton. Oh, geez. Yeah, I (laughs) I will. I'll try. Thanks very much, Anya. Uh, Anya's referencing a a bit of a reprieve that we have from, we've had about three weeks in our home city here of uh, like minus 30 for real, like minus 25 plus uh, just 
unbelievable wind chill conditions and uh we've got a couple of days here where it's going to warm up to like minus five for us so everybody can thaw out and we can move on with life um i've got a couple of things that i want to get to we're going to review the results of our question of the week coming up a little bit later on in the show but i had referenced an, an email that we received and this is from steli and i wanted to get to steli's email uh steli is a, a teacher and uh, this was relating to some of the conversations that we were having yesterday on the show regarding sending kids back to school. That coming up in just a moment, but I wanted to take a second right now to remind you that local environmental services, that's what we're calling local waste, they've rebranded, they've tweaked their brand, if you will, in a way that reflects and represents what they do more accurately. They're about more than just picking up the big garbage bins and making sure that that's handled so you don't have to worry about it. Yeah, of course they do that, but they've also been doing recycling management for as long as it's been a thing. A proudly family-owned business, constantly growing its footprint. Local Waste is now providing free quotes for services in both Saskatchewan and Alberta. We invite you, if you have construction, commercial, or residential waste collection on your radar, to keep it local with local environmental services. You can link to their business under the sponsors tab on our website, ryanjesperson.com. Also wanted to remind you that the team at the Dairy Queens of Northwest Edmonton and Sherwood Park right now have a great deal. And I can tell you it's a great deal uh, from a very personal standpoint because we took advantage of it over the weekend. That's right, right now the take home treats, including the DQ sandwiches and those dilly bars that everybody loves, the DQ classic, the soft serve with the delicious chocolatey coating. Boxes of dilly bars are now buy one, get one free. If you mention Real Talk at the Dairy Queens and Palisades, Nemeo, Newcastle, Westmount, and Baseline Road. I got an email from an audience member the other day that said, hey, I went to a Dairy Queen of Northwest Edmonton in Sherwood Park, and I mentioned Real Talk, and the guy at the drive through window said he didn't know what he was talking about with regards to a deal. I wrote back, he said, yeah, there's a different deal every month. And this month, it's the buy one, get one free deal for the take-home treats at the Dairy Queens of Northwest Edmonton in Sherwood Park. Before we move on to talk to Dr. Paulette Steves, I'm looking forward to this conversation. A Canada Research Chair, Dr. Steves has done a, a lot of work right now when it comes to documenting uh, Canada's former Indian residential schools. We're going to find out in particular, specifically, why this project is so important. But front of mind this week, as well as back to school for thousands, millions of Canadians, quite frankly, many provinces and territories will be sending kids back to school next Monday, including Ontario. That's the plan. Yesterday, it was B.C. and Alberta's turn. And it prompted this email from Steli, who said, I, I was listening to Real Talk, uh, the Monday, January 10th episode on my way home from work today. Steli, thank you. Appreciate it. it says, as a teacher, I've got to say I'm exhausted, but I'm, uh, I'm overall very happy to be back in the classroom. I was listening to some of the Real Talkers comments and I got to say that I'm a bit disheartened. I teach grade four in a lower income area of the city of Edmonton. And to be blunt, I found many of the comments coming across as privileged, uh, particularly those advocating for school closure and even those who might qualify as virtue signalers for sharing how they choose to keep kids at home until the inevitable collapse of our systems. Now, Stelly says, I understand that many people are experiencing anxiety right now, myself included. And of course, an obvious gut reaction would be to just close schools down. But for many lower income and disadvantaged communities, this would be a disaster. School closures hit working class families the hardest, with many parents needing to scramble to find expensive child care or to stay home to take care of younger kids. Many of our families, well, they're just getting back on their feet. I, fact, I have, in fact, two single parent families in my class that have just started new jobs. They can't afford, they don't qualify to take time off right now, and they certainly can't afford to pay for childcare. We have many students who lack proper technology for online learning or even adequate access to Wi Fi. The pandemic has widened the gap between the rich and the poor in many different ways. And I find it very frustrating when people are calling for closures right off the hop or advocating for options that may only work for a privileged few without a thought on how these measures would affect those less fortunate than themselves. Steli says in advance to my fellow real talkers, thank you for listening. I appreciate that email. That'll be considered as one of our emails that, 
could wind up being named our January email of the month. A Real Talk Mug will go to whoever the author of the email of the month is. You can send us an email anytime to talk at ryanjesperson.com. Our next guest has been uh, dedicating uh, many, many hours to creating a comprehensive database of residential schools, former residential schools, Indian hospitals, and so-called Indian day schools in Canada. Dr. Paulette Steves is a Cree Métis archaeologist and associate professor of sociology and Canada research chair in Indigenous history, healing, and reconciliation at Algoma University. Dr. Steves, we're grateful to have you joining us this morning. Welcome to Real Talk. Can you give us a sense of how this project with you began? What prompted it? Oh, well, thank you for inviting me. Um, There were many things that prompted this. When the uh, news came out about the unmarked burials at the Kamloops Residential School, I think it was really important for people to understand that residential schools Um, as we've come to know through the TRC, were places that were really practicing violence against Indigenous people. And when we speak about healing and reconciliation, the first step is truth-telling. And this area of Canada's history was never taught about or discussed, even in public, prior to the TRC. And of course, this was all initiated by survivors of residential schools and day schools and Indian hospitals. I think that Canadians were really shocked at uh, the number of schools and the number of people that were impacted by this. One thing that really um, got my attention was that in many of the public discussions and the government discussions, they talked about residential schools over the last century or, you know, a, a hundred in um, Is it 26 years since Confederation? I forget the exact number of years, but it's much bigger than that. And so if we're talking about telling the truth, we need to discuss the entire history of residential schools in the land that we today call Canada. And I was reading a um, report from a a First Nations group and a, a Native American group in the U.S. on Indian education And in that report, it stated that they knew that the first residential school was actually in Canada in 1620. So that's a lot longer than just 100 plus years. It's not 129 years we've had residential school. The reality is we've had this kind of institutional um, apartheid and, and cultural genocide going on for 376 years. That doesn't impact four or five generations, that impacts 12 or 14 generations uh, of Indigenous people. And so the issue is much bigger. Uh, The federal government doesn't want to be responsible for schools or institutions that were in place prior to Confederation um, and even after Confederation if they were established prior to Confederation. But I think it's really, really important Uh, that we acknowledge every single school and every single institution that was a part of this process of genocide against First Nations people in Canada. I I just had a a, a great conversation with a a journalist, an award-winning journalist, right before we talked to you, uh, Anya Zalegesi from from Vice World News, and she made the comment, you know, before we can have meaningful conversations about reconciliation in Canada, we still need to grapple with the truth. And we've heard that from a number of expert voices, many people with lived experience on this show over the past year. I think for many people, including myself, it's going to be news to us today uh, to hear from you an archaeologist that Canada's residential school history goes well beyond what we understood to be its inception. People think of, including me, uh, former Prime Minister, Canada's first, Sir John A. Macdonald, Bishop Grandin, and others that formed Canada's residential school policy. Uh, uh, you're talking about 200 plus years before that. Um, what's the difference or what needs to be considered with regards to that prior structure Uh, who was carrying it out, the impact that it was having on First Nations, uh, and and then the changes that came about with regards to what Sir John A. Macdonald brought in? Well, it's really important when you're talking about the truth to discuss the entire truth. 
So the the suffering, uh, you know, and the abuse that Indigenous, uh, sorry, that First Nations and, and Métis and Inuit people in Canada suffered because of these colonial institutions didn't start uh, in Confederation. It started much earlier. The intergenerational trauma that was passed on from generation to generation started much earlier. When we're talking about healing and reconciliation, we need to talk about all of the people that were impacted. So the government's kind of take on this is that they're only responsible after confederation, but we need to discuss the truth. We don't need to discuss the financial responsibility. I'm concerned with the truth. I'm concerned with healing for the people. And it's very, I think it's very important for Canadians to realize that this form of, of colonization was instituted for over 376 years. Why do we see such high amounts of you know, social and political inequalities within Canada against First Nations people? It's because there's this embedded history of denial and denial doesn't, doesn't bring forth any form of healing and reconciliation. Truth telling brings forth that. And it was a lot of churches and maybe regional territorial or provincial governments that were involved in this prior to Canadian Confederation. So it was the, the responsibility is of the, the government to address all of the truth, not just what they choose to be maybe financially liable for, but the entire truth and history of this across the last over 376 years. Can you tell us about some of the discoveries you've made or at least the documentation that you've been participating in and how you think that will inform the conversation in Canada? How, how does it serve or how will it serve as a, as a game changer of sorts? Well, I think it really uh, it really talks back to the government's claim of residential schools only being in place since, you know, 18, was it 1865? Um, I think it really helps to inform the general population uh, of this history and how long it's been going on. And we'll have a new database and a new uh, new maps coming out, hopefully by the end of February on our on the website because people that have seen the first website I put up are reporting to me day schools and residential schools and Indian hospitals that weren't on our database. So uh, it took quite some time for um, five students and myself working on this to gather this amount of data. Nobody had put all this data together in one place before. And so that's something I think that's really important. It really highlights the much larger scope of this issue. And for indigenous people, I mean, they're really happy to see this out there. This is a part of the truth telling. This acknowledges uh, what they suffered over all of those years. And I know that we still don't have every single day school or residential school on the database. We keep receiving more information from people daily. A lot of uh, residential schools started and maybe they burned down or they were closed or they moved. But when you look at, you know, the number of churches involved in instituting this and the number of places, it's just immense. I think we're up to uh, 931 institutions. So there was uh, 754 day schools, 146 residential schools and 31 Indian hospitals. And I'm getting more reports from people who lived in those communities and who knew of other schools all the time. If people want to check this out, we're talking about the Canadian Residential School and Colonial Institutions Database. The website is crscid.com, crscid.com. Uh, Dr. When it all comes down to it, I mean, you, you drop these numbers, you're talking about almost a thousand or more than a thousand um, facilities, locations across the country uh, here. It's a, it's a staggering number. What ultimately, uh, when it comes to, you know, the people that are going to hear this interview, the, the people that are going to sit and maybe they're walking their dog or they're, they're on their way home and they're, they're thinking about this, uh, where would you like this to prompt them? What, what do you ultimately hope will be uh, one of the biggest impacts of this database, of your work? Well, I really hope that it brings, you know, with the acknowledgement beginning of healing and reconciliation for First Nations, Inuit and Métis people, that they have a space to share their truth and the history of this. I think for Canadians, it's important that they understand that 
it's highly likely there is not one single First Nations, Métis or Inuit person in this country who has not been impacted by residential schools, day schools and this colonial history of genocide in Canada. And I hope that will help them reflect on their own communities and how they can support First Nations, Inuit and Métis communities. And really this wasn't taught before the Truth and Re Reconciliation came out in 2007 began, this was not discussed in education. This was a hidden history, a hidden part of Canada that really needed to be discussed. So now it's starting to be discussed in education and in public circles. So I wanted to create um, a database. I wanted to create a website where every teacher or every person could go to learn about the history of this in Canada. Uh, people can also uh, read your book published in July, just of, of this last year, just a short time ago, The Indigenous Paleolithic of the Western Hemisphere. I know that you spent more than 10 years working on this, and, and it's really a remarkable work where you, you take a look at uh, the, the history that extends well beyond what I think most people would understand to be that sort of all encompassing uh, period of time, really remarkable and important work. Uh, doctor, I'm so grateful that you've not just been doing this, but you're taking the time to talk to us about it. Thank you so much for sharing your expertise with us. We appreciate it. Thank you for inviting me today. You got it. That's Dr. Paulette Steves, uh, a Cree Métis archaeologist, uh, a professor, associate professor of sociology and Canada Research Chair out of Algoma University. Fascinating stuff. You can let us know where you're at with this as we, as we, uh, you know, dig deeper into some of these stories that we know don't necessarily have uh, an opportunity to be tied up neatly with a bow. Right. This isn't the type of thing where you go. We've had these conversations on the show before where the inclination of many people, myself included, in some circumstances, is, is simply to say, how do we fix this? How do we make this right? How do we reconcile? Where do we go? What do we do? We'll do it now. And more and more expert voices are telling us that it's not that simple and that this takes the time and this takes an, an investment of a great deal of energy. And we don't take for granted any element of that with regards to the people providing testimony, the people doing the research, the people talking about it on shows like this. And we're grateful for it. We know that you're going to be thinking about this. We know that uh, many of you may have different thoughts on this based on your family's history, based on your history, your personal experience. And we welcome your comments to talk at ryanjesperson.com, your comments in the live chat. When you hit us up on Twitter using the hashtag RealTalkRJ, you inform the editorial direction of this show, and we're grateful for it. Coming up in just a second, we want to get to the results of our most recent question of the week. It feels like an eternity ago. We had our, our holiday break, and then we had a, a, an extension of our holiday break based on circumstances outside of our control, and it meant that we weren't with you for two weeks. But you may remember we asked you to review 2021, to take a look at the year that was and give us a sense of where you were at with that. And, and we're going to get into that in just a second. But first, I want to remind you that the teams at St. Albert and Sherwood Dodge have more inventory now than they've had in literally two years. And they're really excited uh, to be able to make available those Ram 1500 pickups that everybody's been looking for. The Jeep Wagoneer, that big new full-sized SUV that Jeep has out competing with the Navigators and the X5s and the Escalades. They've got them all. Uh, and they're sharing inventories as well between their two lots, which means if you don't see what you like at the one dealership, chances are they can find it for you at the other. And don't forget, at Sherwood Dodge, they've got a body shop. I know that because my Grand Cherokee is currently in the body shop because we had a, well, a surprise meeting of sorts. In fact, right in front of my home when somebody spun out of control in the Christmas break and smashed into my parked vehicle as I sat inside sipping on hot chocolate. Portions of this story have been made more dramatic to make it a better story. But the fact of the matter is, I didn't know that Sherwood Dodge had a body shop. They do. And they're good at what they do. You can find them under the Sponsors tab on our website. Also, big shout out to our friends at Eden Landscaping. I was reminding you yesterday that I know a lot of people have big plans for this summer. You're going, once we're through this wave, and once everybody's got their booster shots, and once we can all gather together again, we're going to do it in our backyard on our brand new patio with that natural gas fireplace right next to the smoker and I'm going to have a beef brisket on there and you've got your big plans except for that one thing you, you haven't talked to your landscape designer yet on how you're going to pull it all off 
Don't wait until March or April or May to reach out to Mike at Eden Landscaping. That's what everybody else is going to do. Why not get in touch with them today at landscapeedmonton.ca? Get the ball rolling. You never know how long it might take to get your landscape or your construction materials in. It's a whole new world out there right now with regards to the supply chain. Good thing they've got 20 years of experience behind them. And a shout out to our friends at Friesen Brothers as well. I always tell you about their fresh kitchens, which our family appreciates so much. We go to Friesen Brothers, of course, because we love the fresh Alberta beef and the pork and the chicken and, of course, all of that fresh produce all the time. But sometimes you want to take a break from cooking. You want to pick something up that doesn't taste like it was just grab and go. You know what I mean? Something that actually tastes like what they used to make at Grandma and Grandpa's house. Friesen Brothers has a team of Red Seal chefs, and you can find them at 16 locations across the province of Alberta for more than 65 years. Friesen Brothers has been Alberta grown and Alberta owned. Well, all right. Every Monday, uh, as we did yesterday, we roll out our question of the week. This is presented by our friends, our research and strategy partners at Y Station. And we're asking you this week, the question is up right now. You can go to ryanjesperson.com, click on connect, and you can take two minutes to answer it. We ask you about 2022. What are your predictions for what lies ahead? What do you think are going to be the news stories that really resonate? What's Canada going to look like a year from now? Who's going to win all the big sporting championships and the like? We ask you to look into your crystal ball. Our previous question of the week, which we're going to review right now, we asked you to take a look back at the year that was. And let's take a look at what you told us. The results of this question of the week put together by the talented team at Y Station. Were we surprised or not to see that more than a third of you told us that your overall life was worse after 2021? Now, for context, 36% said life was worse, but 25%, one in four, said it was better And about 39%, let's call it 40% of you say you saw no change. That was kind of an interesting one for me. Here's another interesting highlight from the results of our question of the week. 32% of you, again, about one in three of you told us that your relationship with your spouse or partner was better after 2021. Just 12% of you said it was worse, which means a whole lot of you said that it stayed even keel, that it stayed the same. But I like that. One in three said your relationship with your partner's spouse was better. Here's another takeaway that Real Talkers had. From 2021, one in four of you, 26% said you saw an upswing in your career. One in four of you saw benefit to your career over the past year. Just 13% of you said that your career was worse off. That number is way lower than I thought. That was an encouraging number. How about this? This was an interesting highlight as well. Almost half of you, 48% of real talkers, you told us that your mental health suffered, that your mental health was worse off after this past year. I'm not surprised at that one bit. We are all feeling it right now, aren't we? It's fair to say. This was an interesting one as well. 46% of real talkers said that physical health was worse after 2021. I am among that 46%. And who can blame us? It's all about how we recover now, right? It's all about how we get back on track. 46% physical health suffered in 2021. These are some interesting results from the team at Y Station. 40% of you told us that your relationships with friends were worse off in 2021, which I guess doesn't qualify as a majority. So maybe that's a silver lining. Uh, Sarah Hoyles, Sam Brooks, uh, the production team uh, behind this show. Hoyles, I don't know about you. uh, Were you surprised to see some of the results there? I mean, there were some encouraging ones. People saying, hey, my career did okay." People saying our personal relationships did all right. But but then, of course, there's the reality too. some people saying mental health, physical health. Really, 2021 took its toll. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, I I know that that's how a lot of people have been feeling. I myself, I. I've loved, uh, I'm an introvert, so I really enjoyed it. It's kind of given me guilt-free introversion where I don't feel the guilt of, you know, oh, I should be going out. Oh, I should. And it's also, yes, friends have, some friendships have kind of fallen away, but some friendships have actually strengthened and there's been a recommitment to spending time with them and uh, yeah, going on socially distance hikes and ski trips, um, cross-country skiing. So it's been, yeah, it's, it's been a mixed bag. And I think that's what the results show. I I thought of you yesterday when I saw somebody on Instagram post, everybody talks about FOMO, the fear of missing out. 
And uh, a friend of mine posted yesterday about Jomo, which was the joy of missing out. <laughs> and I thought that that was pretty awesome. Um, he makes no apologies uh, for experiencing Jomo on a regular basis. The joy of missing out. Sam, how about you? What, uh, with regards to those results, I mean, you were just taking a look. You were putting those slides up for us there. What really jumps out at you? Yeah, the, you know, I, there's a. I think a bit of a truism that I've sort of thought throughout a lot of my life is, is like people make time for the things that they care about. And I think that's reflected in these results here is like, I have found that there are people in my life that I have a much stronger relationship with now. Um, I find that there are people in my life that I'm closer to. I find that there are people uh, two years ago that I didn't text or didn't call on a regular basis. And now they're like front of mind in my regular roster. So I think, you know, relationships have shifted a little bit, but we've, you know, we've, we've collectively had this sort of um, realization of what's really important to us. What do you think it was that like with regards to somebody that you may not have texted or called before that you're texting or calling now, what would have been the difference maker there? I don't know. It, it, it's, I, I think that, you know, it, it, there's, there's sort of like diverging paths, right? In, in that sort of the idea that there are some people that, that were handling the pandemic really well and doing things on their own and, and kind of had a tight circle that they were interacting with and, and they sort of looked inwards and, and closed inwards. And, and, and meanwhile, I think that, you know, especially some people that I've met, um, in the past year that have that have had, you know, weird job scenarios or um, they're free during the day at times that I are or something like that. Like it's just I'm connecting with people that, um, you know, due to my lifestyle before weren't as front of mind to me. But, you know, they've they've sort of like floated to the surface and, and offered empathy and support and lived experiences and, and, and willing to sort of like share what they're uh, experiencing in, in a little bit more of an open way. So I think that, you yeah. know, that, that openness is coming from places I didn't expect. Yeah. I've been sharing about this Brovid 19, uh, online poker group that, that we came up with. Um, and, uh, I mean, it, this, that, that was an example for me of something that kind of came up out of nowhere. These are university friends of mine and obviously love these guys and have known them for 20 years, but we did not correspond on a regular basis. I mean, we're, we're, you know, across a number of different Canadian provinces and American States, but, through the pandemic, we've been gathering together once a month to play online poker. And it has been just an absolute, I mean, when I look back on these couple of years, I think I'll look at quality family time, like quality time with my son, and probably that online poker group that gathered, because it's about so much more than that. Everybody knows when you're playing poker until three in the morning, um, you're talking about all kinds of things. Um, the guys are typically ignoring poker because I'm always winning. And so they get very frustrated with that. Um, I, I'm just saying this because I know there's nothing that they can do about it. But but in all seriousness, it's been absolutely amazing. Hoyles, I'm not surprised to see people say that they felt that mental health and physical health suffered. I, I, I mean, I even know me personally, and I don't care about talking about it. I'm happy to, it's, you know, it's part of real talk it comes with the territory with regards to physical health I, I, I feel the lousiest quite frankly that I've ever felt in my entire life you know I mean and this is just my personal journey I do I don't feel healthy now I'm not healthy right now and I'm working to get back on track but there's just been this kind of how do you describe it maybe I don't need to find the words to describe it because I I, I would assume or imagine that most people can can understand where I'm there's just been this kind of meh there's been this kind of blah you know where you're like I'm I'm, I'm gonna order that food deliver. I'm going to eat my feelings today, or, or I'm going to have a martini at 3 p.m. on a Tuesday because it's the pandemic and we're shut down and I'm frustrated and discouraged. And in some days, uh, and it feels okay to say out loud, I'm experiencing despair and people are going to write in and say, you shouldn't drink your feelings away and all these things. Yeah, sure. We can have these conversations, but the point is some people, a friend of mine's lost a hundred pounds through the pandemic. He, he, he looks absolutely unbelievable. I don't even recognize him quite frankly. And um, he, he's feeling the healthiest he's ever felt in his entire life. And some people like me have gone in the completely opposite direction. And I guess maybe the point of me bringing this up right now is to say that's okay too. I think that's exactly the point that it is totally okay. I know that when the pandemic first started, everyone was like, Oh, I'm going to learn how to make that sourdough yeah. bread. Finally, I'm going to, I'm going to make that, that thing that I've always been meaning to get on and, and learn how to crochet or whatever skill that is. Um, and I think we needed to be, I think not too long into the pandemic, it, there was this realization that it's exhausting being in a pandemic period. It, period. It, if, yeah. if someone is able to be super productive, that is incredible, <laughs> but that was not my experience. It's, it's taken extra effort 
to do the things that I love. Um, and yes, there has been a mental health and a physical health toll. And I, ha I get reminded by a friend of mine who's a psychologist, you know, we're in a pandemic. Yeah. Cut yeah. yourself some slack. Cut yourself some slack. I agree. It is totally okay if you conduct yourself in business meetings on Zoom right now, like news anchors have been doing for 30 years without anybody knowing or realizing. And that means business on top and party down below. You've got your dress shirt on, you're wearing your blazer, and you're wearing your sweatpants or your pajama bottoms. Completely acceptable, completely normal, and don't let anybody crack on you for it. I love these comments here on our live chat. Like, the, the, you know, this uh, from uh, Malcolm, who says, I could stay in my house for the next 10 years. <laughs> says, I've been, quite frankly, I've been loving this lockdown personally. That's Malcolm's experience. Uh, meantime, Jillian says she needs a t-shirt that says, sorry, I'm late. I didn't want to come. And I think that a lot of people can relate to that too. The pandemic's changed a lot of things. You've had a you've had a cooked you've had a baked in excuse uh, to not go to stuff you don't want to go to uh, to say no to in person meetings and I know for a lot of people that's been a huge relief. I wanted to get to some of the comments you leave as well because we appreciate this when when you take the time uh, to chime in on this and of course we, we should remind you that our Patreon supporters. We're so grateful for those of you that make a monthly contribution to the show. You you allow us to grow what we're doing. You allow us to, to provide more depth of coverage. And we say thank you to you in, in several different ways. One of them is providing the full top line report for these questions of the week, which means that you're able to scroll through pages and pages of data and get some really great insight um, into where your fellow real talkers are at. Our Patreon supporters, check your emails this morning. You're going to be getting this. Um, we asked you, what are you most thankful for in 2021? And one of you said the ability to be vaccinated for me and my family, you know, the fact that none of us to date have contracted COVID. Another one of you is excited to be able to tractor pull again. I love it. Never been to a tractor pull. I'm going to need to get down to a tractor pull and we can do that again. Really? That Another sounds one like a jam. Oh, yeah, I know it does sound like my job. I've been to many uh, mud bogging events. I've, I've been to several off-road festivals, Sam, but never an official tractor pull. Although I have been to several monster truck <laughs> events, which uh, if, if you've not been to a, a, a legit monster truck event, you know, where they'll sell you the whole seat, but you'll only need the edge. I would highly recommend that because it's a lot of fun. Another one of you said that you're most thankful for reestablishing your relationship with your parents in 2021. You said that it had been broken for quite some time. That's amazing. My friend Tim would call that a praise report. Another one of you said, while we didn't have our usual summer plan come through with family and friends, we made a point as empty nesters to holiday safely this past summer. We bought e-bikes and we've clocked over, what, 2,000 kilometers in the mountains and around our community? The best investment we've made in a while. That's absolutely amazing. We asked, what are you most hopeful for in 2022? One of you said, uh, my hope is that the divisiveness can end and that we can come together to make things better, that we all realize that real discussions, I like that, the willingness to be respectful toward one another and acknowledging that we need to make more of an effort to right our wrongs, I endeavor to prove that we can all be more human with each other. I thought that was beautiful feedback. Another one of you says you'd like to see a universal basic income or at least a national disability plan implemented in 2022. Another one of you said you hope we can travel more and feel safe. You told us that you miss your siblings in Saskatchewan. You miss traveling out of the country. You said you hope to be able to do more visiting in 2022. Who can blame you? I like this. We asked you 30 years from now, if you pick up a history book about the year 2021, what event from the year would be on the cover of the book. One of you said January 6th, the insurrection in Washington, D.C. Another, vaccines. Another, the climate change-related disasters in British Columbia. Another, the discovery of the unmarked graves at former residential schools across the country. I think all of those could absolutely factor into consideration for the cover 30 years from now. Why Station wanted to know what event should be on the cover of that book, but won't be. That's a great question. One of you said the sacrifice of healthcare workers. Another said the staggering number of deaths from drug poisonings and the 20 plus people affected by each one of them. Another one of you said women's soccer, Canada's team winning gold at the Olympic Games. Another said water continuing to be undrinkable. 
in many First Nations communities. And another one of you pointed out the growth of QAnon. You suggested that should be on the cover or could be on the cover, but will not. I mean, that directly ties into January 6th, doesn't it? Who would you name as your person of the year for 2021? I want to rip through this list. I love this. Julie Rohr was prominently represented, a dear friend of this show, prominently represented in your feedback. And we thank you for that. Another one of you said healthcare. Many of you said healthcare workers. Another said the scientists that developed the COVID vaccines and treatments. And Dolly Parton got a shout out. Which <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what did I miss about Dolly Parton. But Dolly Parton is just the more that you the more that you read and hear about Dolly Parton, the more that you realize what an absolute beauty she is. You know what I mean? I mean, I would just yeah. hear these stories about Dolly Parton, how she supported other, uh, in particular, women in entertainment, but young entertainers. The, 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 the work that she's done, of course, is a big star, but also behind the scenes through her decades in entertainment. Dolly Parton getting a shout out here. And I love that one. Yeah, huge philanthropist, like just puts her money where her mouth is and does it very privately. She doesn't do it. She doesn't toot her own horn. She doesn't do it for the notoriety of it. She does it because she believes in something. And she is somebody that is able to cross those polarized lines, you know, left, right and center. All love Dolly. Yeah, I love it. I was realizing after we wrapped the show yesterday, I was, you know, we, we sort we talked a bit about Betty White and Bob Saget and Sidney Poitier. And we call it in the business, we call it an air check. I went back and I listened to the show and, and between the conversation that you and I had, I was like, did we spend enough time? We had a lot to talk about. We had to talk, we, we were talking about families going back to school. We were talking about, you know, t- two weeks passing since we had done our last episode. We had a lot to catch up on, but I was thinking, you know, the impact that Sidney Poitier had, uh, I mean, I mean the, the first winner, uh, black winner of an Academy Award, an absolute uh, when it comes to Hollywood's all time greats. He is certainly on that list and his accomplishments, um, I think, uh, more significant than many others based on factors at play. You could say the same thing about Betty White. You made some important points about that. Uh, her decades in entertainment as a woman blazing trails in, in, uh, you know, on, 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 in, you know, not just in film, of, of course, in television. And I, I mean, from age uh, 20, all the way through to 99, uh, really amazing. And then of course, Bob Saget, I mean, the impact that he had pop culture and otherwise, um, I felt like we could have talked for an hour yesterday about those three and still probably not done their careers justice. Agreed. <laughs> yeah, I know. I was like, I was listening. I'm like, did we, I was, I was like, did I talk enough about Sidney Poitier? I mean, just even him. I mean, there's something about him. He's, he's kind of, he's, he's one of those actors where he just brought this certain, when you'd hear that he was playing a role, you, you'd be like, I'm going to watch. I don't even care what the rotten tomatoes thing is. I don't care what reviewers, I don't care what anybody's saying about the film. I'm seeing it because he's in it. He was one of those actors. Uh, for me. And so really remarkable stuff. So Dolly Parton getting a shout out from Real Talkers, which we thought was really cool. And then we asked you about anything else, your final thoughts, uh, 2021, your year end summary. One of you said, I learned that no matter what, I must not slip into despair. I let it happen over the past two years. Life is beautiful and I cannot sit idly by and mourn its passing. The pandemic was a wake up call for me. Grief is something to be tended to, not cured. And I'm learning that it's part of me now. And in its own way, it's beautiful. I thought that was amazing. And I wanted to wrap today with this comment because it hit me like a ton of bricks in the best way. One of you simply wrote in on your question of the week to say, real talk saved many lonely days. And that means the world to us. There's the team of three of us that you see every single day that bring you this show. And then there's our uh, expanded team behind the scenes. And we're so grateful. I am so grateful to be working with that team and to be doing this for you, our audience that continues to show up on a daily basis and really just elevate the conversations that we have here on the show. Coming up tomorrow, we're going to take a closer look at some of the stories that continue to make news. And and I'm not done with the story of this pig heart. We need to dig more into the story of the pig heart in the human chest. That's a fascinating one. Plus, we're going to continue to take a look at this rat tracker project and the future of retail. How is the pandemic year three impacting the stores and the retailers behind them? That's where we'll go. We'll talk to you soon. The